scores of school children abducted from Kuriga in Kaduna State have been freed unharmed after 16 days in captivity. That's according to the state governor, Senator Uba Sani. The Kaduna State Governor extended thanks to President Bola Tinubu and the security forces for ensuring the safe return of the school children. A rice correspondent, Nisi Gabriel, reports. After enduring two weeks in captivity, the kidnapped Kuriga school children have been freed. Upon receiving the news, families of the rescued students flocked to the government house in Kaduna, eager to embrace their loved ones once more. After a closed door meeting with Governor Basani and heads of security agencies in the state, Jubri Kuriga, whose nine year old daughter was among those abducted, expresses the prevailing sense of jubilation in Kuriga town. Jubilation, in fact, jubilation all over the village. I'm here in the government house to receive my child as the government calls us to, to see our child. But we are here even though we've not seen them, but we have been assured, we've been informed by the governor himself that these are children are with them. They are taking care of them by tomorrow. They want to do some, you know, they want to maybe give them some something. By tomorrow, after treating them, they will hand over the children to, the, to their parents. And uh, we appeal to them that uh, they should accept them. And uh, these children need to be treated very well because of what they passed through. And they need to go back to school. So. Images of the rescued school children have circulated widely depicting them appearing visibly exhausted, distressed and untidy. Authorities have announced plans to reunite them with their families on Monday, March 24th, following necessary grooming and care. Yes, some people died because of this that happened. Some people died. And you know, me, I've, uh, in fact, we've been feeling very bad. Very, very bad because we cannot expect a small child, seven years, nine years, ten years, you know, in this, in the hands of bandits. How, you know, no food, you know, no drinking water. So how do you, how do you, in fact, you have to feel very, you know, you just have to, how would you feel if it's your child? A local teacher in Korika had earlier told newsmen that more than 280 children were taken. But the defense headquarters in a statement say 137 hostages have been freed. Officials have yet to comment on the discrepancy in numbers. That number I cannot tell you now. we we'll wait to tomorrow. If all of them are back, if still, still many, some are remaining, we're going to talk to the government because we've not seen them all. But if they are, if they are all back, that's, that's all right. Why many waited patiently for the abducted Kuriga school children rescued in Zamfara to arrive in Kaduna, Governor Obasani welcomed the arrival of the IGP Special Intervention Squad and two armored personnel carriers in the state to address the ongoing security challenges. The squad, consisting of 200 specially trained police personnel, aims to combat banditry and terrorism. I also want to commend him for supporting us to see that uh, we bring back our children who were abducted from Kuriga community. I'm happy that they are back home now. They are with us and police have played a major role. The governor appreciates President Sonobu the National Security Advisor, Nuhu Ribado, and all security agencies for their efforts in ensuring the safe return of the abducted Kuriga school children. Nisi Gabriel. Arise News, Kaduna. Meanwhile, President Tinubu yesterday issued an advisory to his friends and well-wishers ahead of his 72nd birthday on Friday, saying the recurring incidents of insecurity across the country do not warrant any celebration on that day. In a release titled President Tinubu's 72nd birthday on March 29, 2024, by Special Advisor to the President on Information and Strategy, Mr. Bayo Nonoga, the President said the current sad developments in the country will not allow for any form of celebration for his birthday. According to him, because of the present mood of the nation, 
and recent killing of the officers and men of our army and police in Delta State, and recent spate of security breaches by criminal elements in different parts of Nigeria. There should be no form of birthday celebration. Joining us now is Terence Kwanun, a security expert and national coordinator, National Coalition Against Terrorism. Good morning, uh, Mr. Terence Kwanun, and thank you for joining us on the morning show. Good morning, and thanks for having me, Dr. Abate. Thank you very much indeed. Well, quickly, um, 137 uh, pupils, we're told, have been uh, rescued by men of the uh, Nigerian uh, army. And there is, uh, you know, ju jubilation in Kaduna State. But we have the issue of not knowing the exact number. Initially, we were told 287 pupils were abducted along with a teacher. Now we're told the number is 137. Some papers are reporting 168, whereby today we would be able to know the exact uh, figure, we hope. Uh, at least the school should have a school register, as I was asking our correspondent uh, uh, earlier on. But, I mean, what is the way forward? There is a safe school initiative that the Nigerian government is talking about. And Ahmed Abodunui of uh, the civil defense is now saying, well, the government is now thinking of you know, uh, officers of the uh, civil defense in 36 states of the Federation and the FCT so that they will be deployed to schools. Would that be of any help? What should government do, really? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Abati. First off, we need to commend uh, the government and the security agencies for the efforts they have made uh, for these children to return home safely. Uh, because it is quite disheartening uh, that you live in a nation where every now and then you hear students go to school and terrorists come to pick them up. It's, quite, it's not quite uh, palatable news. Uh, and like you know, this was the 75th that we've had, uh, school kidnappings, and within the Northwest region alone, uh, that was number 58. That means about 70% of these challenges are coming from that region. And so even if we're strategizing to be able to curb these kind of situations, we already have a statistics that can be able to favor us. And if we look at the terrain that these things are happening from Kaduna State, we have a long stretch of forest that pass through Zamfara, that pass through up to uh, the Northeast. And uh, we need to, as a nation, come together and be able to look at these ungoverned spaces and know exactly what we are going to do uh, with these ungoverned spaces because we need technology to be able to go into these ungoverned spaces and know exactly what is happening there because it is the territories they are controlling within our nations, these ungoverned spaces. They are totally in charge of these ungoverned spaces to the, to the extent that even our security forces see these ungoverned spaces as strange territories to them within our nation. So when they are going there, they are going into a territory that is controlled by another person, and the person knows the territory better than them, and they are always at risk going to confront them in those territories. And because they have these territories to themselves, it is always easy for them to sit and strategize to be able to cause these havocs to us as a nation. So moving forward, one, we need to strategize and know exactly what we are going to do with our government spaces, retrieve our government spaces to be within the commands of our security forces, push these terrorists out of our government spaces, and we can be able to strategize and know how we are going to protect our communities. Because if we look at this terrain, that these things are happening properly, they are deep hinterlands of our nations that when you leave our urban centers, you drive hundreds of kilometers with bushes left, right, and center before you even get to the next community. So it's always very easy for them to operate, get into a schools, carry children, and are able to navigate so many kilometers into this forest. So in as much as we are commanding the security forces, we need to see a proactive measures that these ungoverned spaces are no longer in the hands of these terrorists. There is issue of safe schools. We have discussed this on this platform over and over again on the issue of sponsorship and the modus operandi 
of the safe schools because the safe schools is supposed to be a collaboration of the civil defense and all the security forces put together. But when even the budget was being handled uh, during the budget defense, the civil defense were even not aware that there was an allocation for safe schools. We only later realized that the police have already gotten an allocation for safe schools and they were ready to implement it on their own, no longer to synergize with other security agencies. So already there are discrepancies within the, uh, the issue of safe schools. They need to synergize together and they need to leave the urban settlements and go into the schools that are more vulnerable to be able to protect them. Uh, and also, the vigilantes, we need to commend them because they, from what we have gathered, they gave a lot of intels on how the students were moved. And actually, it was a very difficult operation, even for the terrorists, because those minors are extremely difficult to control uh, when you have them uh, uh, in your care. And so, since they were not planning to kill them, I know it was going to be a very difficult situation for them. So whatever happened, because we have not heard of any casualty, so there was no kinetic action uh, during the operation. And so whoever have negotiated with them, they did a very good job because we don't have casualty yet. The issue of number, I think so far we have the official statements of 137 and uh, we need to hear from the school if truly everybody that come, uh, that was rescued was the people that were taken from the school, and from there we can be able to resolve on the issue of number. All right, uh, Mr. Quanam, thank you so much for that. I'd, I'd like to piggyback off of your uh, point about ungoverned spaces, that uh, you know the, the number of ungoverned spaces is a key cause, a key co source of concern uh, for some of these occurrences, recurring occurrences that we see. Uh, however, of course, Kaduna is known for its reputation for having several military bases and key agencies. Uh, you have the Nigerian Defense Academy, uh, Air Force Base, Police Training College, so many of them. Kaduna is even known as the garrison town. Now, how does a state that hosts such elite military agencies and that harbors such sophisticated weaponry for the nation, how does it become the victim of these recurring attacks? Where do these, where's the disconnect? Well, no, the, it's not an issue of disconnect. It's an issue of allowing enemies take over your ungoverned spaces. When they begin to control those spaces, and they become strange to you. Who is supposed to be in charge of those spaces? It becomes an issue because if you don't use technology, you can even run into landmines, you can run into ambushes, and you keep losing personnel and all of that. And this is a long, long stretch. This Sambisa forest we keep hearing in the northwest stretches from the northwest up to the northeast. And so it's a long, it's a long forest and it's a long territory that we have left in the hands of these enemies. And so in as much as we have all these commands in Kaduna, if we don't use technology, which it is so strange why we, uh, our security forces have not resort into the use of technology because we need technology to go in and be able to pick exact locations and pick exact landmines that are within these spaces for our ground forces to be able to go in safely. And if we don't do that and we keep commanding uh, our officers to go into this forest, we are risking them the more and we are going to be losing them in their numbers. And all of us know that we don't have this number to risk at that level. And so we need to sit as a nation, re strategize within our security architecture to bring in technology to be able to curb the issue of ungoverned spaces. It's not just in the northeast, it's all over the northern Nigeria. We have a lot of ungoverned spaces that are ignored that these enemies have been have taken over and we need so much work to be done. For now, we have, all, we have advised that most of these schools that are vulnerable should move their centers closer to the urban centers so that oppressions will be done within the government spaces when, so that when we recapture them, we can be able to resettle these communities because for now, it is quite the risk because a lot and lot of terrorists who both within and outside have migrated and have taken over our government spaces. Okay, I'd like to ask you this, and I mean, we're happy the students are back. Why is it that we didn't get the data right? From two something, we are here, 130 something. Is that we couldn't ascertain the data? 
did it re-juxtapose with the schools properly? That's number one. Number two will be, why is it that when we hear rescues like this, we don't hear engagement and arrest of the terrorists? All we hear is, oh, they've been brought back and everything. I mean, it's looking too much like an ecosystem thing because we're just waiting for the next attack to happen. And when it happens again, we go through the cycle again. This is from the Kagara children to the one we have now. So why is it that we never get to arrest these people? They never, the military says, okay, they, they come and they rescue. Is there a conversation going on somewhere? And we asked Nisi, we once had a story where a reporter had said that they were already negotiating with them, but the state refuted that. So is this something going on in the ecosystem that we need to know? Yeah, thank you so much, Rufai. The issue of data is a, an issue of concern to all of us because at any time we have uh, this issue of schools, uh, kidnappings, we keep hearing different figures right from the school to security agencies and government. It is because there is no proper data within our school systems. And we need to quickly address that through the quality assurances departments of our education se sectors to be able to get the correct data at any point in our school environment. It is going to help both the security and securing the environment they are operating within. The issue of uh, rescuing without arrest, uh, when you have vulnerable people within your custody, it is obviously easy to negotiate your way out of an arrest because uh, the government and the people need the people in your custody alive. And that is why I was saying that going forward, now that the students have been rescued, we need to go further and conduct an operation within our government spaces and make sure that we recover them to be within the control of our armed forces. And until we do that, we are going to be having this back and forth because you cannot go and be arresting people who have your children in their custody. Obviously, there are going to be a kinetic action. Obviously, we are going to have casualties, maybe on the uh, side of uh, the children you want to rescue, or on the side of the terrorists, or on the side of our security forces that are trying to do the rescue. So that was why we were commending them for rescuing uh, these uh, children uh, without any casualty. We know that obviously there's going to be negotiation and we know that any nation would have negotiated to be able to bring uh, their children back without any casualty. But we don't need to stop at just rescuing the children without any casualty. We need to go further and make sure that it never happens. We already have a statistics that is favorable for our security uh, forces to be able to strategize because 70% of these things are happening within the Northwest. So they can be able to comb the ungoverned spaces within the North, the Northwest, move people that are deep into the hinterland, closer to the urban centers, and be able to carry out sophisticated operation from the ground to technology to the air and everywhere to be able to rescue the ungoverned spaces so that we can be able to have uh, our country back and safe. And then initiate agricultural programs within these ungoverned spaces by government so that there will be activities to avoid these people coming in without being unnoticed. Well, Mr. Kwanu, well, you, I heard you very clearly. You said they must have uh, done uh, uh, you know, adopted a non-kinetic approach, and that's why uh, we didn't have casualties. But you recall that uh, the uh, kidnappers had asked for a ransom of one billion naira. The president, at another occasion, said, "You know, the government of Nigeria would not pay any ransom uh, to kidnappers." And now we're told by the same presidency and also by the state government that the children were rescued as a result of collaboration between the federal government, office of the NSC, the uh, military, Nigerian army, and also local uh, authorities. And you've also talked about negotiations. Is it possible that the Nigerian government had to part with some money? Uh, is that what possibly happened? Or the bandits well, were now, just, were just uh, we have got, very nice. They just released the pupils without uh, collecting any money, just, uh, you know, uh, 
Uh, they just wanted to be nice. What, what could have uh, transpired? Uh, uh, th thank you very much, Doctor. But for now, we have no confirmation of exchange of uh, ransom yet. Uh, but we know that there were some activities uh, within the community that the uh, children were. And we don't want to uh, go speculating here. Government had made their stand that they were not going to pay the ransom. Uh, but there are efforts before, for, between the federal government, the state, and the, uh, the local communities in trying to bring these uh, children back. But it, obviously, uh, the situation that went on uh, within those communities is going to be unveiled as we speak. We're still waiting for confirmation uh, from the school to get the actual number of the people that were kidnapped. We're yet to confirm from the school if everybody that was kidnapped uh, was brought back safe and uh, nobody is held back and X, Y, Z. So there are a lot of things that are going to unfold uh, between now and moving forward. And if there was a ransom paid, obviously, we are going to know because it's going to be in the public domain. But for now, we don't want to speculate. We want to commend them for what they have done. Our children are back, but we don't want it to happen again. And so they should be able to be proactive enough to be able to uh, protect uh, us, our properties, and our schools uh, so that these things will not happen again. It's not quite palatable uh, when you as a government is moving around the whole world calling investors to come in and you're having this at your hands. And we are, as a nation, is going to have a lot of challenges when these things keep happening on and on and on. Uh, because a few months ago, we were commending them uh, for keeping the country safe on the road and all of a sudden there are escalations from the northwest to the middle bed and everywhere prices just uh, uh, spark off and everywhere became unsafe. And so they need to sit up and be more proactive in what they are doing to protect this country. All right, these children were abducted in Kaduna and they were retrieved or they regained their freedom, <clears throat> excuse me, in Zamfara State, uh, almost, you know, 200 kilometers away from where they were taken from. Is it really, I know you've already gone into, you know, to great lengths to, to dis describe the terrain and the thick forest and the so forth, but is it really possible for this journey to happen with so many children so many human beings involved completely off the radar or is there a sense that there must have been some sort of collaboration with the the powers that be in that area because it, it sounds a little bit strange that hundreds of people would be transported 200 kilometers without a trace uh, thank you very much it's not uh, they don't actually go without a trace uh, if you could recall we have already discussed how communities within the Northwest that people have insisted that to be within their ancestral homes, pay royalties to these terrorists to be able to live within their ancestral homes. And now we have also discussed here how communities within the North prefer to collaborate with terrorists than the government forces because whenever they collaborate with the government forces, they witness a lot of casualties and destructions within their communities. So most times, they pass within these communities, notice that no one is ready to give out information because they don't want to be attacked. So not that they go unnoticed. They move within terrains, people see them, and sometimes even when they are passing, people applaud them as they pass because they are always on bikes carrying four or five people with arms shooting in the air, uh, like in the military circle, they will say gyrating and all of that. And if they even come to markets with some of these communities, they come to their markets, buy food sometimes, carry the food, they dash them the food, and all sorts of things are happening within the North, just because they want to be safe, just because they don't believe that our security forces can be able to protect them. And so we also need to rebuild confidence in our communities in the north, for them to know that the government can be able to protect them so that instead of collaborating with terrorists, they should be collaborating with the government and giving them interest. 
And it is because the distance was that long, and it is because there was also proactiveness within the Zamfara Axis at the moment, because the government in Zamfara at the moment is doing so well working with the locals. And I think that is where the interns were leaked, and the negotiation also might have been able to take place this fast. But in all, we need to commend the efforts that were put in for this student to be rescued. Uh, we have cases of special negotiators. Uh, while all of this was happening, uh, Sheikh Gumi was talking about possibility of negotiating. Also, we've had um, Tuko, which uh, is a publisher of Desert Herald, that had negotiated in the past, but apparently now with the, the security authorities is falling out. Uh, can't we also use these special negotiators to be able to end all of this once and for all, since the negotiators know where these people are? And secondly, the question I was asking before is, even after the rescuing, can we not still go after these people? Because what you are saying invariably with the hailing of these bandits and terrorists when they move past is that we've built a war economy that we've come to accept in that part. So how do we change that war economy? Yeah, thank you so much, Rufai. The issue of ne negotiating with bandits, first off, is not an option. Second, the government has refused to negotiate with bandits. What we are expecting to see from the government is what they intend to do if they are not negotiating with the bandits. And that is why we have suggested that so long as you allow your ungoverned spaces to be in the hands of terrorists, you will not avoid these things that are happening. What the government is supposed to do is to recover the ungoverned spaces that these people are occupying. Once you recover those ungoverned spaces, one, the, the terrorists are going to attempt to live within the communities, which is easy to fish them out. Once this is not done, this is going to be happening. And by the time you arrest, you want to negotiate with terrorists, it means that there's a lot of recruitment that are going to take place within their circles. Because most times, when you begin to negotiate with terrorists, the local vigilantes that go out to fight the terrorists form their own gangs to be negotiated with also. Because these are all people that know these terrains. So I... I'm of the opinion that it is better to conduct proper operations and rescue the ungoverned spaces and push terrorists away from there. Once they come within the communities and it becomes an issue of lone wolf attacks, we can be able to identify them and get majority of them. Well, Mr. Kwanu, the question is how? We get the theory that government has a responsibility to recover those ungoverned spaces. But how? The Nigerian army is overstretched. I mean, they are, you know, oh, oh, you know, they are even understaffed, given the kind of responsibility uh, that they are having to shoulder. So how, in practical terms? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I have suggested here that we need to bring in the use of technology. When you're fighting uh, situations in this kind of terrains, 50% of the job is done through technology where you are going to use drones to go into the ungoverned spaces and pick your target easily. And then you come with your airstrikes and take them on. And it's going to be quite easy. So with the personnel we have and with the use of proper technology, we can be able to get into these ungoverned spaces in no time and pick them out. Because it is we have already known that 70% of this forest is within uh, the northwest region stretch up to the northeast. We know almost the entire stretch of the Sambisa forest and all of that. And so everybody that is within the forest at the moment should be our enemy and the drone should be able to go in and do the job for us. All right, Terence Kwanam, uh, security specialist, thank you so much for your insights today. We really do thank you for your time.